afternoon. Um, so my talk is about production ready go, so let's get started. Um, it's a panda. Um, my favorite animal, I think everyone, surely everyone agrees that pandas are awesome. Um, and it's sleeping, and it looks really cute sleeping. Um, so quick, quick show of hands, who likes sleeping? Pretty much everyone, I thought so. So I did a Twitter poll, and turns out most people like sleeping. Um, not, not everyone, uh, but I think we found the person that's volunteering to, to do on call. Um, so, so why does that matter? Um, in my experience, production systems seem to have this really peculiar property. So this is a graph of um, ONS website and its service failures over the last 12 months. And as you can see, it likes to wait till you're asleep to fail. Um, and even when it decides that it's going to wait until you wake up, it, it still doesn't give you too much flexibility. Um, so in our case, it turns out that uh, Google and archive.org like to scrape our site overnight. And if there's anyone that's going to find the subtle resource bug on a link that nobody ever clicks, it's going to be them. Um, don't know about anyone else, but if I get woken up in the middle of the night to fix a production issue, <laughs> I can't make any promises. Um, I'm not condoning any violence in the workplace, of course. So, hi, I'm Ian Kent. I work for ONS Digital, which is Office for National Statistics. I've been the tech lead for the last 18 months, and we're responsible for the ONS website and the publishing platform. Um, we've been using Go for around about 18 months, and there's a few other teams across ONS that are just starting to experiment with it. And before that, I was the lead developer at Company's House, just accidentally gave a slide away. Um, we used Go there for around about two years. So, so why am I here? Um, I've written some seriously bad code. I think probably most of us have. I still write seriously bad code. Um, it gets a little bit worse. I've deployed some seriously bad code, um, and a little bit worse still. Um, some of it is still there. Uh, this one actually bothers me quite a bit. Um, I've learned a lot about Go since I started. Um, not always the easy way, and sometimes that's meant being woken up in the middle of the night. Um, so I'm not here to say, if you're putting Go into production use, that you should do X, Y, Z. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the things that I've learned, and hopefully you can take some of that away and apply it to your own code. So production ready Go, uh, what does that actually mean? Um, so here's a couple of things that I won't be talking about. If you haven't heard of them, it's worth looking them up. Um, they're really important. And a couple of other things that I also won't be talking about. Again, I think these are really important, particularly if you're putting systems into production. Um, but they're not specific to Go, so I'm not going to talk about those either. So the most important thing that I've discovered, deploying Go to production is too easy, which sounds like a bit of a strange thing to say. I mean, that's, that, that's why we choose Go. Um, it sounds like a good thing. Um, but it means you can do things like this. That is 14 lines of code. It's a fully functional web server. It doesn't really do a lot. Um, and it works. There's no build errors, there's no lint errors, there's no vet errors. And you can deploy it into production, and it does exactly what you think it will. Um, in a development environment, that code is probably never going to fail. Uh, you can even load test it, and it actually does a pretty good job. Um, I don't know how clearly you can see that. Uh, all running locally on a single MacBook, it gets through 1.2 million requests in 60 seconds at 20,000 a second, absolutely no errors, and an average response time of 195 microseconds. So that's quite impressive, um, but that's on a local environment with the client and server running in a trusted environment, and it's effectively a development environment. Um, so the purpose of my talk is to try and go through some of the things that you might not catch in a development environment, but that will fail or potentially could fail when you put it into production out in the, in the wild internet where anyone can come at it. So these are my biggest mistakes. So the ones that I'm particularly talking about are the ones that, not just minor bugs, but where if, it's, if it goes wrong, it's probably going to start taking out your entire service and causing service outages. Um, there's a bit of a pattern to these, in my experience. It's, the really serious bugs always come down to resource usage. So things like CPU, memory, disk, network. Um, 
a lot of the work that I've done is on production systems, uh, sorry, distributed systems. And when these kind of resource problems start happening, they tend to propagate quite quickly. And it, it really doesn't take long for what can be a, a quite a subtle bug to become a complete service outage. Um, they're also important everywhere else. So I'm, as I said, my experience has been mostly in production uh, distributed systems, uh, powering websites and back-end processing. Um, but I think they're important for uh, command line apps and pretty much any Go code that you write that involves any kind of resource usage. Um, the best bit is all of these are actually really easy to fix. The amount of code that you actually need to write to do that is quite minimal. Uh, so I'm going to have a quick look through each of them, and I've made the mistake of deciding to try and do some live coding demos. So what could possibly go wrong? So first up, client timeouts. So mainly talking about HTTP, but it applies to any TCP connections. So whether that's HTTP, FTP, SSH connections, or databases. Uh, it also applies to UDP connections, so when you're doing things like DNS lookups. Um, it's also really worth thinking about adding timeouts to any long-running operations, whatever they may be. Um, but there's one particular common use case in Go, which is HTTP, so I'm going to have a look at that. And there's a problem. Default client in HTTP package doesn't timeout. There isn't any default timeout set, which means that the package level helper functions like get and put and delete could potentially block forever. So let's have a quick look at what that actually means. And this is potentially where it starts going wrong. Uh, I think that was the wrong button. So hopefully, this will be big enough for you to see. I don't think that will be. Let me just change that. So to start with, a uh, really basic example, something we've probably all done quite often. Very basic HTTP connection. Um, connect to a website, download the request body, uh, the response, um, and we're just going to output a quick message to say that we're connected. So if we run that, works perfectly, thankfully. Um, it's exactly what you'd expect, but, but that can go wrong. So if we change the URL to something that should always fail, so I'm going to start this demo first. Um, that IP address is something that is called an uh, unroutable address. Um, the point of it, and the reason that I chose to use it for this demo, is because in theory it should never time out. Uh, there's no possible way that um, the network stack can ever route any traffic to it. And if I manage to keep talking for long enough, we'll see why my demo didn't work. I actually did this demo at uh, Go Meet Up in Cardiff, um, and I was really confident that this would, would never time out. Um, and apparently I just didn't leave it long enough. Because uh, after about 30 seconds, it does. Um, which kind of goes against the idea that um, the, the default client in, in net HTTP package doesn't have any timeouts. Um, so I actually learned something from this, which is that even though default client doesn't have any timeouts, default transport does. So some network errors, like a connection timeout, will eventually fail, whereas others, if you're partway through reading a response body, um, can hang forever. So let's do a quick demo of that. Um, and I won't leave this one running forever, because it might never, but it will never complete. So we'll open a, a local server, and if we change the URL to localhost 8080 and rerun it. Um, so you can see the connection come in. And I'm not going to sit here and wait forever, because this one genuinely doesn't ever time out. Um, when I was preparing for this, I left it running for half an hour, and it was, it was still going. Uh, thankfully, the solution to that is actually really straightforward. Um, instead of using the default client, we can create our own. And it's very simple. You set a single property of timeout. And for this demo, we'll just set it to time.second. Uh, the only other change we need to make is swapping http.get for cli.get. And that's it. So if we rerun the same demo, it actually times out. So I'm glad that demo worked. Um, really, really simple fix. Uh, Obviously, if you're building a bigger application, you can define a default client yourself, which has those more sensible defaults set. Um, so that really is it for HTTP clients. It's that easy to protect yourself against any potential network issues. Um, 
So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about HTTP servers. So server timeouts. Um, I should probably get my speaker notes back so I can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, exactly the same problem as client timeouts. Listen and serve in net HTTP doesn't timeout. Much like the default client, the package level helper functions in net HTTP for listen and serve and listen and serve TLS don't actually set any default timeouts. Um, which is interesting, because pretty much every code sample that you'll see, every tutorial around creating a web server, uh, suggests using them and doesn't even mention timeouts. Uh, there's a writing of web applications uh, to, uh, tutorial on the, the Go website, which also tells you to use those package level functions and also doesn't mention timeouts. Um, timeouts are important, even more important potentially for a HTTP server, especially if you're putting that out on the internet. Um, it becomes a great denial of service attack vector. Um, if you've got untrusted clients in an untrusted environment, um, they can take your service out quite easily. So I'm going to attempt to demo that, and this is the one I'm a bit more worried about. So let's see how this goes. Uh, so. Wrong window. So really basic web server, um, pretty much the example we started with earlier. And if we just run that, and kill localhost on 8080. Uh, let's try adding minus V. So it works perfectly. You've got a fu fully functional web server. Um, and again, like I said earlier, in a local environment, that just does exactly what you think it will. Um, but we can make that fail. So let's have a look at that. So for the purpose of the demo, I'm going to cheat slightly. Um, I'm going to change some local settings, particularly file descriptors, to simulate more, something, an example closer to what it would be like if it was in a production system. So if we set the U limit to 20 and rerun our server, and then uh, so I'm going to use a, a client that has been specifically written for this demo. Um, the purpose of it is to make requests and read responses incredibly slowly. So slow client and we're going to set the speed to 10 bits per second. Um, if somebody was trying to take out your website, this gives them a really nice, easy way of using up very little bandwidth and very little resources, but blocking up lots of resources on your side. And we're going to open 20 connections to localhost 8080. So immediately, you can see that on the server side, it's refused to accept any more connections. And on the client side, we've got client errors. So I mean, that's pretty bad anyway, but we can take that a step further. Let's uh, do that. And even though all those connections have failed, no more connections can get in. So that means with very little resource, um, an untrusted user on the internet can block up all of the available file descriptors on your website, and you will stop serving traffic. Um, let's just clear up that. So similar to the client, uh, the client timeout settings, uh, doing it with the HTTP server is also pretty straightforward. Uh, instead of using the default package level functions, you define a server struct, and you just set some basic properties. So we'll set the address, because you don't pass that in anymore. Um, and we'll set some basic timeouts. So you can set read timeout, and a write timeout, and an idle timeout. And you need to take care to set all of them. Um, if you keep any of those without a default setting, there is always some way that uh, a third party can attempt to, to take your server offline. Uh, and then we just change from HTTP.ListenAndServe to server.ListenAndServe, and you no longer pass in any arguments. Um, so hopefully, if this demo works, we shouldn't have the same problem as last time. So if we rerun the server, and rerun our slow client. So we get exactly the same errors. But this time, if we try using curl, and you can't really see it there, but we get a 200 response. So what we've proved there is even though we've got a dodgy client that is trying to take our site offline, just by setting some basic timeouts, we've managed to protect ourselves against it. And again, that is, it's that simple. That's all you need to do to get 
HTTP server with a little bit more protection before you put it out on the internet. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about HTTP servers, and I'm not going to go through any code demos for this. Um, but if you are putting a HTTP server out on the internet, there's a couple of other things that you might want to consider. Um, TLS settings, so you might want to change the defaults for Cypher and Curve preferences. Um, if you're interested in reading that, about that in a bit more detail, there's an excellent blog by Cloudflare. Uh, there's a link at the end, um, and it goes into a lot of detail about the various things that you need to configure for a HTTP server. Uh, you might also want to consider using read header timeout instead of read timeout. So read timeout takes control away from your HTTP handlers. Um, if you set read timeout, that is fixed for the entire life of that request, and your handler doesn't have any control over that. If you use read header timeout instead, the HTTP server package in Go takes control of the um, reading the headers, but allows you in your handler code to take responsibility for deciding what is too long for that particular request. Um, you should also probably... Um, so I completely forgot this bit of a demo because I lost my post-it notes. Um, in the HTTP package, there is a helper function called handler timeout, uh, timeout handler even. Um, timeout handler looks like a really easy way to protect yourself against those things. Um, actually, I'll, I'll take that back. I will demo it because I'll show you how easy it is and why it isn't a brilliant idea. Um, so if we start with our server again, um, and let's just clear this. So the timeout handler is really easy to use. You can just wrap your handler functions in http.timeouthandler, and you can set a default timeout and a response message for when that goes wrong. Uh, so with that small amount of code, it feels like you've got some protection. Um, if we rerun our server and we rerun our slow client, you get the same errors. Um, but this time, if we kill localhost, you get the same problem. You get an empty reply from server or a connection reset, and all of the file descriptors are still being blocked by the client. Um, there's also a couple of other issues with uh, the timeout handler, which is that it doesn't implement some of the interfaces like Flusher, um, which means that you can't, uh, well, Flusher or something I've forgotten, um, hijack, which means that you can't use things like WebSockets, for example. Um, so it's a nice easy fix, or it looks like a nice easy fix, but I, I wouldn't recommend using it for a production system. Um, one thing that is worth mentioning is if you've got your Go server behind a load balancer or something like Nginx, um, that will give you some amount of protection. Um, you should probably still think about doing it in your Go app anyway, but it does give you a little bit more safety than just, um, than just running your code out in the wild. Um, so. That, that, I should say that is, that is it for HTTP servers. Just setting those basic values is enough to give you some amount of protection from slow clients. So the next bit is uh, operating system signals. So I don't know how much anyone knows about those, but the messages that can be sent from the operating system, um, they're defined in the POSIX standard, um, and they're used for something called inter-process communication. Um, they tell you things like when your operating system wants your application to shut down or quit, um, sometimes they're generated by hardware, so if the, the CPU or the, the, the actual physical machine that you're running on decides to shut down, it can send signals to your applications. Um, sometimes it's generated by a process manager, so if you're running something like Nomad or Kubernetes, um, that can send signals to your application as well. And sometimes they are generated by the, uh, by the user, so uh, if you're running your code in a terminal window, when you press Control-C, that will send some signals to your application. So, a very quick overview of OS signals. The three at the top, kill, stop, and continue, um, you can't really do anything with those. Um, SIG kill is always handled by the OS. As soon as the OS receives SIG kill for your application, it kills it immediately, and there's nothing you can do about that. So, we can pretty much forget about it. Um, stop pauses your process. Uh, again, that's handled by the OS, so you can't really do anything with it. And continue is actually passed to your application, but before it gets that far, it's also handled by the OS, so it's a reasonably useless signal. Um, SIGQuit and SIGINFO were ones that I discovered while I was researching for this, uh, for this talk, um, and they're actually really interesting, so I'll quickly demo those. 
Um, so SIG quit uh, does a core dump and forces your application to exit, and SIG info will dump out some process info, which is actually quite useful. Um, so if I just switch back to the terminal. So if we've got a really basic application, and we'll just get it to sleep for 10 seconds. And that, that's all we needed to do. I've made this mistake before. Uh, there you go. Um, I'll, I'll try and remember next time. Um, so really basic application. It's just going to sleep for 10 seconds and then exit. So if we run that in the console, um, I'm not going to wait for that to finish. But if we do control backslash, it exits immediately and dumps out a stack trace. So that's quite useful if you've got an application that's blocking somewhere or if you want to find out exactly where you are in the application. Um, and it, it, that's default behavior for, for Go. Um, you can choose to override that if you wanted to, but by default, control backslash will do that. Um, control T is also quite interesting. So when your application is running, if you press control T, you get the CPU and system time output. And you also get to see what your process ID is. Um, that is actually handled by the shell. So shells like Bash and ZSH support it. I, I'm not sure about others. Um, and I think that signal does get through to your application. So you could choose to do something with that as well if you wanted to. Um, very quickly talk about SIGPipe. So SIGPipe is used to give you Unix support. So if you're writing an application that reads from standard in and then writes the standard out and you want to chain that together with other applications, SIGPipe is the thing that will tell you when the thing you're writing to has gone away. So if you're writing to a network socket or if you're writing to a file and the device disappears or if you're writing to another process and that process exits, your application will receive SIGPipe and the default behavior in Go is that it will immediately exit. Um, again, you can choose to override that if you wanted to, um, but the default behavior actually makes a lot of sense. So the two that we really care about are sig int and sig term. So sig int is sent when you press control C, and sig term is sent if you just do kill and you pass in the process ID. Um, what is quite interesting with those is um, that is if you're just doing it from a terminal. So sig int and sig term, um, that's, a def that, that's the default signals that you will be sent for those key combinations. Um, if you're running your process in a cluster manager, so something like uh, Docker or Mesos or Kubernetes, um, most of them will send a sig int and will give you 10 or so seconds to shut down, and then we'll send a sig kill to kill your process. Um, the exception is uh, Nomad for some reason, which has decided to use sig term and then a sig kill. So if you are handling the signals in your application, you really need to handle both of them. Um, so I'm going to try and do a quick demo of that as well to show you how easy it is to intercept those. And I'll try and remember to switch the screen. Uh, that didn't work. Awesome. Um, so uh, if we create a really basic application, um, and we're not going to get it to do a lot, but we will defer a function, and the deferred function will just get it to print out, done. And from the specification in Go, we would expect that whenever that main function exits, that we will get our deferred function run. So if we then create a timer, and we'll just wait for five seconds, and we'll just block waiting for that to complete. Um, there is a reason for the slightly weird syntax there. So, so that code demo um, does exactly what you expect. You can leave it running. After five seconds, it will print done, and it does exactly what we expect. That doesn't work if we run the application and then press Control-C. The deferred function never actually gets run. So if you're relying on that to clean up resources, um, it's something you need to be aware of. Thankfully, like the others, actually handling those signals in Go is really straightforward. So. Signals in Go are sent down a channel, so we'll just define a sig channel, and it uses os.signal. Um, and that's not how you define a channel. There you go. Um, to actually tell the runtime that you want to receive those signals, you just call signal.notify. 
and you pass in the channel, and then you tell it, uh, you give it a list of the signals that you want to you want to respond to. So the first one is OS dot interrupt, um, and the other one we needed to handle was syscall dot sig two. Um, so that looks a bit weird. Why is one in the OS package and the other one in the syscall package? So across all the different platforms that Go supports, uh, interrupt is supported on every single one of them. Um, so that means it can be put into the OS package, so nobody needs to depend on the syscall package. SIGTERM, on the other hand, isn't supported across every single platform. Um, so if you're building applications for things like Unix, then you have no choice but to depend on the syscall package for that. Um, and all that will do is send a signal down the SIG channel. Um, so if we listen for that as well, um, and hopefully, if the demo works, So if we leave it run, like we did last time, after five seconds, you get done. And if we run it and then press Control c this time the defer function also gets run. Um, really isn't very much code, so easy to implement, and allows you to actually clean up resources properly before your application exits. Um, and that's pretty much it for signals. It's really, really straightforward. Um, I think there was something else I was going to add, but it's completely gone. Um, so, the last bit I wanted to talk about is cancellation. Um, I was going to go into quite a bit of detail about this, but there was an awesome talk yesterday by Jack, um, who went into a lot of detail about the context package, so I'm just going to give a very, very quick overview. Um, I would recommend that you go and watch that talk if you didn't get to see it. Um, cancellation effectively allows you to just clear up any resources that you no longer need. So if you start things like database or API calls across a network and you no longer need them, you can cancel them and claim back the resources. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but like I said, it's worth watching Jack's talk from yesterday. Um, a lot of the, the uh, default or the standard library supports cancellation, so packages like Connect HTTP and Database SQL have got cancellation support built in, or context support built in. Um, database SQL is a, a bit of an odd one. It is driver dependent, so even though the Database SQL package supports it, you need to check whether the particular driver that you're using also supports it. Um, context can also be chained, so you're, it gives you the ability to propagate cancellation throughout your application. Uh, the other bit that I'll mention is Cancellation isn't just for servers. Um, the Go blog, when they introduce the context package, talk a lot about HTTP servers and how you can use the context package to handle cancellation. Um, but actually, the mechanism that is implemented in the context package is useful for a lot more than that. So whether you're writing command line apps or whether you're writing back-end processing systems that are reading from things like Kafka, you can use can cancellation there as well. Um, you can also use um, cancellation to propagate OS signals. So this is the one bit where I will slightly disagree with the talk yesterday. Um, it was suggested that you should create a background context when a request starts. Um, I slightly disagree, because actually if you create the background context when your application starts, when you then implement graceful shutdown, you can propagate that signal all the way through to uh, to all of the handlers in a single call and allow the context package to deal with that for you. Um, so we'll look a very quick look at cancellation in Go, um, and particularly for HTTP handlers. Uh, can't remember how to get out of that. Uh, so if we start with our... Um, so this is more or less the same demo as we used earlier, um, a server that's already implementing timeouts. And just to be able to demonstrate this, I'm going to get the handler to just return, uh, to, well, to count up to eight, I think I went with. Um, so we'll put a counter in there. And all that's going to do is, when you open a connection to the server, it will count up to eight and return that to the client. So if we run that, um, So that counts up. Uh, I think I've just mixed up two different demos. This might not go very well. But, but, uh, I'll change that bit. That's not what I was trying to demonstrate. Let's try it again. So actually, instead of counting up to 10, 
which was a bit of a demo that I missed, and I won't try and go back to. Um, when the request comes into the handler, we will just um, we'll block for five seconds using a timer. Um, that could be simulating anything like an Elasticsearch query or a database call. Um, so we'll just uh, we'll use um, we'll, we'll use select again for this. If we create a new timer, and we'll set it to we'll go with three seconds, and then we'll just do a select on that and wait for timer to to finish. And if I rerun the right demo, uh, and if we now kill localhost 8080, uh, I'll add one more bit to that. So when, it, when the timer returns, we'll put out done. Uh, so start that again. And now if we curl it, that will block for about three seconds, and then we will get the response back from the client. There you go. So uh, from the server, sorry. So in the server console window, we got done as expected. So the, the problem with that is um, if the client goes away, which if you're out on the internet, you can never guarantee that a client is actually going to stay for the end of the request. Um, so if we curl that again and then immediately cancel it, after about three seconds, the server will say done again. Um, and that's probably not what we want if that's consuming lots of resources. Um, this is the bit which is unbelievably simple to do in Go. Um, we can just add an additional select statement, and the request has a context, which has a done channel. And effectively, when the HTTP client goes away, um, the Go HTTP package will propagate that down to your handler, and the done channel will receive a message. Uh, I think actually it gets closed, but um, we know at that point that the request has been cancelled, so we can just return. So if that was a long running op uh, operation, then you'd probably want to propagate that cancellation down, but is th that demo would have got far too complicated. If we rerun that, uh, and so if we curl it and we wait three seconds, exactly the same as last time, we get done. And this time, if we curl it and then cancel, you get a cancelled message instead. So that allows your handler to know that it doesn't need to bother finishing the request because nothing is, the, the client's not there to receive the response anyway. Um, So very quick recap, uh, client timeouts are quite important, server timeouts are quite important, and none of the default implementation in the net HTTP package sets any, with the exception of default transport. Um, and in a distributed environment or an untrusted environment, that could be the difference between your service staying alive or going offline. Um, similar with OS signals, particularly for uh, distributed environments, so if your platform is um, Scaling up or down, it will be using signals to communicate to your application that it needs to do something. Um, or if you consume too many resources, or um, or, or if um, a new environment, uh, a new EC2 instance, or that kind of thing comes online. Um, actually, that's the wrong way around. Ignore that. Um, and finally, cancellation allows you to clean up resources that you don't need anymore. Um, so I'll finish with a quick quote from Dave Cheney, because I think this is quite useful. And what, what he said was, never start a Go routine without knowing how it will stop. And the point that he's trying to make, which I think was referenced earlier, in an earlier talk, was Go routines have a cost. Um, they're not free, and if you start to leak them, that can cause resource issues. Um, personally, I think I would take that a bit further. Never consume any resources with not, without knowing how you'll free them. So just like Go routines have a cost, so do other things like network connections, open files, and leaking any of those is bad. All of them will have an impact on the performance of your system. Sometimes you can rely on the Go runtime or the OS to clean up for you, but it's normally safer to clean up yourself. And with how simple it is, there's really not any excuse not to. Um, a little bit of further reading. Um, I found those quite useful while I was preparing for the talk. Uh, if you're really interested, there's some great Wikipedia articles about POSIX signals, and there's lots of RFCs that explain in a huge amount of detail why you need timeouts on HTTP servers. Uh, that was a fascinating read. Um, thank you. <laughs>